So, so we're talking about things that you buy that last forever. And, and I have to admit, I, I have twice now purchased Timbuktu bags. And the first one I got uh, when I was still a college student and it had super bright colors on it so that I could leave it at the front of the room and then be able to find it when exams were going on and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And 10 years later, I no longer wanted a bag that brightly colored. And the thing was still in perfect shape. Right. And and so grudgingly, I bought a second one that is gorgeous, and I still love how it looks, but it doesn't have the feature to slide it on to an upward, a four, four-wheeled roller bag, because those didn't exist yet when I mm. got it. These bags outlast, like, changes <laughs> in the universe, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like that idea of buying things that bring you joy you know yeah that, what is marie kondo although apparently now she's she's not able to stay on top of keeping her house tidy thanks to children right right which i could have told her that but um but uh, you know i'm 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 in the process like i've got some knives that i'm not very happy with and i do a mm. ton of cooking yeah which by the way uh, i just want to i've been using chat gpt uh-huh. as a as a recipe designer so what i did really? was i went through all of the ingredients that I have in the house. Uh-huh. And I have a pretty well stocked kitchen. You know, we've, I've talked about my pancake recipes in the past. And so I've fed in all of the raw ingredients that I have. And then I asked it to start making recommendations for meals that I can make out of this. Oh. And it's done an amazing job. Like it's, it's so I say, so I say, you know, load in all of these ingredients into your memory are you ready yeah. and it goes yes i'm ready i've loaded i'm ready to provide you with solutions and then i say okay give me 10 dinners that i can make with the ingredients that i have on hand and it makes meals that i've never seen before tried before i've made a bunch of them so far like just following the recipe and carla thinks they're some of the tastiest recipes i've ever made that's just Which is, wild and a bit it's terrifying amazing. oh it's yeah i for one welcome our robot overlords so yeah, yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun, um, and and I'm, I've got access to the API now. Okay. And so you can do some. So so the thing that I'm building right now is what I'm calling the the archive decoder. And so what it'll do is it'll go through each new entry on archive uh-huh. and summarize it in layperson terms and come up with some some uh, single line sentences titles essentially that try yeah. to synopsis synopsize what yeah. it is and it allows me to read through scan through all of the breaking research on archive today and understand it and then decide if any of these are stories that we want to report on universe today damn so i don't think that this technology is ready for prime time like i can't i can't and I think it's, I think people are making mistakes when they think, oh, I'm going to use ChatGPT to write my college essay. That's right. a terrible use of ChatGPT. What ChatGPT is good for, it is a brainstorming partner that never runs out of energy. That I can say, give me 10 recipes out of the ingredients I have. And I'll go, here you go. Here's 10. I'll go, now give me 10 more. And I go, no problem. Here's 10 more. Now 10 more. I, we could do this all day, right? <laughs> because it never runs out of energy. So, and you can like build it into spreadsheets with their API. You can do things like mm. um, you can put a down an ingredient and then it will give you 10 recipes just in the next cell in the spreadsheet or give you a, a recipe in the next cell in the spreadsheet that is the that is a food that can be made with that recipe. And and I have stupidly complex allergies like it has gotten yeah. to the point that I have a traveling companion because I will default to doing things that will cause me harm just because it's a new set of allergies. Right. Yeah. And and this is something where I can like give it the list of over 800 items that contain latex in it and say, give me things that are safe. Yeah. Well, that see, is so, powerful. So it is, but it's also, it's also um, incomplete and it yeah. lies and it hallucinates. And so I'll give it all of my recipes Mm-hmm. And then it'll say, you should make stuffed bell peppers. And I'm like, I didn't say that I had bell peppers. I don't have bell peppers. Oh, I'm so sorry. You could make something with bananas. I don't have bananas. Oh, I'm sorry. You should make something with chicken. I told you I was vegan. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right? So, so, so you, like, 
the problem is, like is like on the one hand it's incredibly powerful and yeah. on the other hand it lies hallucinates is confidently wrong you like i asked it to add it's up the an calories undergrad yeah i asked it to add up the calories and it and it was like no problem the total calories are are whether 1411 in this meal i'm like and then i double checked its math and it added it up wrong it was off by about 20 calories and i'm like okay show me your math line by line it was like no problem you know here's the calories for this here's the calories for that da, da, da. you add those numbers together and you get this number and that number was wrong and it was just because he just doesn't know how to do math. <laughs> it, it, it knows what math smells like. It knows how math sounds, but it doesn't actually know how to do math. And oh so it's, my! Yeah, it's really funny. And so, and so, it's just it, it's just not ready for for you to be able to trust it. But as a companion, yeah. It's wonderful, and I'm I'm looking forward to how I can leverage it for what we do in a way that still there has to be a human. You know, it's like a self-driving car, but the human has to be holding the wheel the entire time. Yeah, that's yeah. how I see this being of value. So, dang. Um. All right. I'm I'm enough dilly dallying. Let's get into the show. Okay. I am pressing record button one. I am finding my phone and putting it where it will stop buzzing. Do you have the pictures ready? No, thank you. I'm unpressing record, deleting that garbage. Opening, thank you. So I, I've been traveling this week. I am still recovering from being up doing late nights with telescopes. It was an amazing week. Um, and I appreciate everyone's patience. But if I look a bit bedraggled, it's because I am. Um, and our in the Twitch chat is entirely right. I am not to be trusted to get the snacks because I'll do things like forget Oreo cookies are playing Russian roulette because sometimes they're made in factories where they use latex gloves and sometimes wow. they're not. And, and so I will blithely reach for a bag of Oreo cookies and grab a fistful to shove into my face hole without thinking through, I need to try one and wait. Um, mm. rub, yeah. rub it on your arm and wait. Yeah. Yeah. That's actually pretty. I should do that. Yeah. I that's how that. you like find a mushroom in the forest. You rub it on your arm and then see if you get a raise. And if that, yeah. if that doesn't work, then. You touch a little bit to your tongue and then see what happens and if that doesn't work then you 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 know if that doesn't make you sick then you cut up a little tiny little mm -hmm. bit and so on and so forth the, on the island that i grew up on yeah. um there was a, a friend of my father's who just he just loved to eat mushrooms and so he would just and he, he just would try them all and he just had this method that he would go through to oh. figure out which were the ones that were good and which were the ones that were harmful to him poisonous toxic and he just slowly through trial and error very slowly and carefully learned every mushroom in his environment and and now eats tons of mushrooms yeah. confidently and yet yeah. avoids all the ones that make him sick and and for me it's a is this processed food made in a factory with latex gloves mm -hmm. yeah it's it's hard don't eat any processed food that's the trick you know, the problem that I run into is there are so few ingredients that I'm not allergic to anymore that, like, I I have to have processed foods because there aren't enough in-season fresh foods. Mm. So corn chips are, like, the default. There is no such thing so far that I have encountered as a corn chip that can cause me harm. Oh, good. There you One go. cannot live on corn chips, but I'm sure as heck trying to live on corn chips. Anyways, well, I'm... You're talking about it in the past tense. No, he's still he's still alive. He's fine. He's fine. <laughs> I mean, he's old. He's fine. Um, okay, I'm pressing the record buttons. I've I have pressed also, the record buttons. I've also pressed record. Excellent. Astronomy Cast, episode 672, Space Debris Removal. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today. With me, as always, is Dr. Pamela Gay, a senior scientist for the Planetary Science Institute and the director of CosmoQuest. Hey, Pamela, how you doing? 
I I am doing well. I just got home from a wonderful few days. Uh, Dustin Gibson, Ian Lauer, they taught me how to use some of the telescopes out there. And I just want to give a shout out to them to actually bring in the clear skies. I don't see those very often. So you had clear skies and you were around telescopes. Yes. Yes. A miracle occurred. Pigs flied. Flown. Yeah. I don't know the past tense of that right now. Winter continues Flew. here on the west coast of Canada. Uh, my wife shared a, a post on Facebook where it said, this isn't winter anymore. This is harassment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I thought that was perfect. Yes, yeah, like yes. I've got I've got a couple of inches of snow on the ground here in mid March. Mm -hmm. And that is deeply unusual, mm. except for last year which was also deeply unusual, but even the snow was gone last year. So yeah, this is just, this is just sick and wrong. I have, I have fruit trees to grow. I've got things to plant. I need the weather to behave. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> We've talked about the rising problem of space junk. Okay. We know it's an issue. So what can be done about it today? We'll talk about ideas to remove space junk, making sure that space is open to use for centuries to come. And we'll talk about it in a second, but it's time for a break. And we're back. So we've gone on and on complaining, whining, wow, 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 space junk, there's too much debris up there, Kessler syndrome, we'll never leave, we're trapped eternally. Okay, fine. What's somebody gonna do about this? How do we stop this? It basically comes down to we need a, a uh, giant space ball style vacuum cleaner to to grab all of the junk and failing that people are going up with various uh versions of grappling on with arms deploying magnets and there's even like if you've ever played flag football where you pull the flag off of somebody and knock them out well we're looking to do more of the pin the tail and the donkey version of that we're sticking flags onto bits of debris to give them extra drag and there are right, so many ideas so many. all right we'll go through these ideas bit by bit but but let's start with what i think is the best idea which is don't produce space junk yes. in the first place yes exactly so, so how do we minimize i guess what part of a spacecraft of a launch generates space junk it, it all depends, but we, we currently have, as forms of space junk, the second and higher stages of rockets that instead of falling back to the, the atmosphere and self-destructing in the atmosphere, have instead decided in orbit's a good place to be. We right. have defunct uh, satellites that are just hanging out, being dead and unsteerable. We have things that have fallen off all manner of mission, uh, been dropped by astronauts. And then, unfortunately, there's also the debris that either came from missions that self-destructed on deployment or were quite purposefully split apart by uh, various nations testing their ability to do harm mm. or things colliding and there's and i guess one of the biggest is the is the spent boosters when you think about yeah. a rocket launching you have the first stage launching and then the second stage takes over and the second stage continues to fire its engines until it has put the spacecraft into essentially its final orbit yeah but that means that it is also in that final orbit and exactly. so the the payload and the booster then continue on. And these boosters can be gigantic. Yes. I mean, they're as big as school buses. They, and they, they're orbiting around the Earth. They occasionally get mistaken for miniature asteroids that we have caught in our orbit. And no, they're just boosters. And then you've got, and so the, the first stages, they either land back on a barge or burn up in the atmosphere. The fairings will crash into the ocean. Or be caught. Those, or be caught, yeah. But that it's that second stage, yeah. And you know, even potentially a third stage on, say, the Saturn V. They're still out there. In many cases, as you say, they are they are orbiting the sun and are confused that people are confused and think it's an asteroid. So, what can we do to minimize boosters, uh, 
sa- dead satellites in the end with some pre-planning? How can we help these objects take care of themselves? Well, there there's basically three different strategies for getting rid of the boosters. The simplest would be having them retain or have any dis- different system just enough thrust that they can send themselves back down through the atmosphere. Alternatively, if they're only going to low Earth orbit, you can have them have drag systems that hmm. cause their orbits to decay significantly faster. And we've seen some tests recently yes. with this technology. They're, they're super cool and they're super bright. So on one hand, it's really cool to look up and know that bright streak of tether up there that I can see with my off-the-shelf telescope is, is a satellite doing something cool. At the same time, though, it, it is a bit problematic, but launches at least aren't as common as communication satellite constellations. And there was a recent test uh, of a European Space Agency mission. They deployed this little 10 centimeter cube drag sail onto yes. the mission and then it f- flew up performed its functions and then it deployed this drag sail that kind of looks like a solar sail yeah um and then what would have taken five years for it to the orbit it only took one year because it had a much larger drag coefficient with the Earth's atmosphere and it cleaned itself up so imagine them putting these modules on every single spacecraft that's yes. designed to work in low earth orbit but as you say it's got to be low earth orbit got to be interacting with with the the, atmosphere with the atmosphere or it's not going to function and i really think that using lightweight materials to create large amounts of drag is the easiest way to go unfortunately it's not an entirely predictable process which means that you have to do a lot of effort First of all, knowing the orbit for these itty bitty little tiny things and then seeing how they change. And as we approach solar max, our atmosphere is going to be changing in size on the regular as we're struck by energetic particles from the sun. Mm. Um, so there, there is going to be a new level of chaos in this upcoming solar max that we haven't seen before as we have more and more low earth orbit communication satellites, more and more CubeSats, right. and a misbehaving atmosphere. All right, we're going to talk about this some more, but it's time for another break. And we're back. So then let's imagine a a situation where someone has launched a booster or a satellite that doesn't have any method of returning itself back down to Earth. Could we rescue it? Could we send up something to deorbit it later? Yes, and there, there's been some initial tests of this technology already that, that I think is super cool. This, this is where we had back in 2020 the ELSA demo, and I, I would love to know who managed to come up with this. It stands for End of Life Services by Astroscale. And during their demonstration, they they carried up with them a, a second satellite that they ran their tests on, and they let go of it, and they initially just caught it. They let it drift and caught it, and they were practicing over and over just how hard is it to catch a satellite in these different scenarios. Like a cat playing with a mouse. Exactly. Right? Releasing and- it, catching it. Yeah, that's cool. And, and Astroscale is very much planning a one-for-one one kind of system where you launch up one of their satellites, it magnetically grapples onto something, and then it and the something it grabbed both come down out of orbit. Um, so so that that's one way of doing it. I personally am intrigued by some of the new plans that are coming out of a UK funding challenge where they're saying, okay, we want things with arms that will grab things. And I can imagine a future where you have robotic arms grabbing things and hurling them towards the atmosphere. I I don't know quite how the angular momentum will work on something like that, but it amuses me. Um, And then we have- But at least grabbing them with arms, latching on, and then firing the thruster, and then carrying- it and its payload into the atmosphere. 
And and the other big set of examples we had came from Northward Grumman, where back in uh, February 2020, they docked onto an Intel sat that was above geostationary orbit. This was a parked and left for dead mission. And they successfully grabbed it and brought it back down to geostationary orbit where it could continue doing its job. Um, another uh, test they did was in April 2021. Uh, this was their Mission Extension Vehicle 2. And they docked with another Intel sat, this time in GEO, which is an extremely crowded area of orbit. And but also a big space. It's a big space, but yeah. they proved that they could successfully navigate within this region and extend the life of satellites. And if you can extend the life of satellites by either refueling them or adding something onto them that has that additional fuel, you can extend their life and you don't need to launch more things. Right. And yeah, the best way like to buying, avoid junk. It's like buying an older car yeah. and maintaining it. And that means that you don't need to buy a new car, which removes one additional car from the road. Yeah. So it makes a ton of sense if they can rescue these older satellites that that have just merely run out of propellant, but they're yeah. still functional, or they've lost their guidance system or whatever, you can attach, you can bolt on this, this, I don't know, parasite satellite, <laughs> <laughs> right, that then performs yes. those additional functions, like, you know, it has propellant on board, it has guidance systems, it has a better communications array, whatever, that can then fix whatever is the problem of that satellite. It's a, it's an elegant solution. Yeah. And I, you, you would imagine, instead of spending $500 million to build an entirely new communication satellite, you just end up a $20 million propellant tank mm -hmm. that with arms. That, well, that, that latches on and then performs that function. I love the idea. And and imagine a future where instead of moving the entire propellant tank, which would have to be pretty big, you park in some middling orbit, 14,000 miles up or something, and you have a giant refueling tank that can itself be refueled from Earth, and then a small army of little robots that can grab onto things. And and potentially, we, we figured out how to refuel aircraft by simply making sure that they had the right nozzles to grab onto each other. Now, if we can figure out how to build spacecraft compatible with refueling satellites, we will have a future where there's just this flock is the best word I can think of, of little res little boosters that simply do all the Holman transfers in the world to get from one orbit to another and refuel these things. And mm -hmm. that's the future I want, an army of small grappling robots mm -hmm. that refuel things. Yeah, I mean, the non-reusability of spacecraft today is still kind of crazy. And yeah. You know, Musk would always make this analogy, be like, imagine if your airplane, every time you flew your airplane, you you destroyed it and bought yeah. a new airplane, it would make trips to Europe very expensive. Yeah. Well, to push that analogy further, imagine if inside that airplane was your car and you mm -hmm. would drive the car out of the airplane while the airplane was lit on fire. And then you would drive your car until it ran out of gas, the one tank of gas, and then you would walk away from the car, Yeah. which is madness. So yeah, yeah, if you could if you could maintain, restore these satellites and then if you could then design them mm -hmm. to to make this process very easy, pull out the main bus, swap out the reaction wheels. You can just imagine this scissor armed yeah spacecraft with all kinds of parts on board sidling up next to the to the satellite that's having problems and sw hot swapping out parts. Yes. I love that future. Yeah. This, this is right. the future I want. Now, mm -hmm. all the things that we've talked about so far, though, they only apply for things that are big, essentially. And right. the scary stuff in orbit is that millimeter to centimeter right. level stuff. All right. Well, we'll talk about that in a second, but it's time for another break. And we're back. All right. 
So let's get scary. Let's talk about the little <laughs> stuff. So as as we thought initially occurred with the MS-22 capsule on the International Space Station, you can get stuff that is millimeter size moving fast enough that it can puncture spacecraft. And this is disturbing. Because mm -hmm. uh, once you get down to millimeter, you can't, if it's moving in low Earth orbit, see it at all. It's, it's you just, you can't discover it. Yeah, and ground tracking stations are tracking tens of thousands, close to 100,000 oh, yeah. objects that are one centimeter or bigger. Mm -hmm. And when you think about, say, a bell curve, there's this whole region of stuff that is smaller than one centimeter that is still very dangerous. A thing that is half a centimeter across hitting a spacecraft is a very bad day. Yeah. And, and this is where you have to figure out how do we go out and catch stuff with a craft that if you match speeds wrong, if you do it wrong, you're going to end up sending your space cleaning mission, tumbling, spinning, perforate it. You're right. And it and, becomes part of the problem. I mean, yeah. Like, let's just talk about the energies involved here, right? These spacecraft are going uh, 10 ish. I forget what's what's orbital velocity, like 28,000 kilometers an hour. Yeah. So, so let's say you're off by a thousand kilometers an hour. Well, that you matters. hit a spacecraft with a piece of debris at a thousand kilometers an hour, it will potentially destroy it yes. and cause a whole new cloud of debris. Mm -hmm. So you can't get this wrong. And this is where folks are starting to look at ideas like using magnets, which will hopefully make the speeds make sense, doing matching orbits to try and grab things. It, it all started actually in the mid 80s where NASA had the idea to basically grab things with like the idea of running around with a giant tarp, except it was a spacecraft <laughs> and catching right. things inside of it. It's just, it's gotten more and more complex. And one of the difficulties is we have things going in a whole range of different directions around the right. planet. Yeah. So, and like, let's stop on this. And because I think this is the heart yeah. of of what everyone in their mind is is thinking about solutions to this problem right now. But mm -hmm. like, let I just want to, I want to just really hammer home the scale of this issue. You've got close to 100,000 objects. Yeah. Each of which is traveling around the earth at 28,000 kilometers per hour. Mm -hmm. If you approach this object, not exactly the same speed, yeah you are either going to shred the piece of debris or your spacecraft adding to the problem. And so if if you said to, to a mission planner, I want to recover this one meter chunk of metal from space, they'd be like, no problem. All we need to do is design a $50 million spacecraft with robotic arms, put it on top of a $100 million Falcon 9 launch. So you're looking at a $150 million mission, it will fly out to this one meter piece of debris, grapple it with its little arms, and then hug it close, and the two will re-enter the Earth's atmosphere together. Throwing oh, out also all the, the investment of money. Well, not throwing out. I mean, you cleaned space. Yes. You spent $150 million, and you removed one little chunk of metal. And the problem is, is that if you want to remove a different chunk of metal, you need a different $150 million mission to go get that piece of metal yeah. and, and just add those numbers up. Like, like there is no easy way to just collect all this stuff yeah. with one spacecraft because each one requires a change in velocity. And so you need to add propellant to your spacecraft to go after each one of them. It's a, it's a thorny problem. Mm-hmm. That it we really, let get really away is. from us. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the solution then? What's What are the ideas um, to remove the debris in a way that doesn't require a, a, a multi-hundred million dollar project for each piece of debris? Right. So, so for the smaller stuff, folks are still working on the idea of coming very close to matching the orbital speed and just scoop. 
mm. and scoop. So you can imagine a set of of precessing orbits that go from a little bit closer to the Earth to a little bit further out so that as you're going through any given orbit, your speed is just slightly different from the stuff in that orbit, right? allowing you to catch it. But you have to be close and you can only catch things that are in a very close orbit. So you could have a mission that it's a little bit in and it's a little bit out is moving over time and it just keeps grabbing a little bit more and a little bit more. Right. But, and it uses a little bit of propellant each time to slightly change its orbit to grab yeah. the next piece. And so you could you could mathematically work out this ladder of of orbits. Yeah. And hopefully instead of you spending two hundred million dollars to collect one piece of debris, you could spend two hundred million dollars to collect a hundred pieces of debris. And and this is like flying around with a spider web essentially, where you just keep catching things. And trying to catch it in something that is exceedingly flexible, just like a spider web, when a fly hits it, brings that fly to zero velocity very quickly. Right. Well, in this case, it has to bring it to a matched velocity very quickly. So trying to build something that can have all the needed maneuverability and all the needed flexibility, these are the things folks are thinking about. And and then for the middle size stuff, you just tag them like a game game right. of pin the tail and the donkey but it really sounds like i mean i like that idea tag tag them like maybe even from afar like you yeah could, you could fire some kind of uh backpack at them <laughs> that contains their drag <laughs> sail right right and then or a tether to something yeah. that, that you could you could increase their drag with. somehow right and this has been this has been proposed again but i like i've got i've got to say when you think of the scale of the problem it is like going into a war zone and collecting all the bullets in flight. Yeah. And and could it be done? Yes. Theoretically, you could chase down all of the bullets that are being fired in a We in need a, in a Magneto. War zone. We really yeah, need Magneto. But, it, but nobody is going to take on that expense. That everybody's just going to turn back and go, no, this is not. So so lasers to the rescue, right? That that is one thing that folks have talked about is using lasers and light pressure to move things around. That again is another high energy thing. I I have to admit I'm so, so the idea is we don't think about it, but all the lights that are currently shining on me in the studio are exerting a force on my body as the photons collide with the surface of my skin. Now. If you zot something with a powerful enough laser, that, that energy is either going to get transformed into melting something. You can usually write in chocolate with a strong green laser. This is something I enjoy doing. That's or cool. if it's a highly reflective surface, that laser light will hit the surface, transfer all of the momentum from the photons, and cause that surface to move. And, and so this is like slowly moving something with a water gun, except those water drops from the gun have a whole lot more mass than those photons, but they're moving slower. So, I mean, it's, it's a strong enough laser on a reflective enough surface. surface. You can move things. Mm -hmm. It's, again, high energy, but it's also highly focusable. So one right. more idea to add to the arsenal. And that's, I mean, that's to bounce things off. But yes. the other idea is to ablate. And I, I like yes. that idea yeah, as, that one because I... it's a lot more effective. And, so and you... go ahead. I, yes, I, I was just going to say the idea of ablating is, is you basically are removing layers of the material until it is no more. Um, well, but also it acts like a propellant. So you fire a, a high enough power laser at a piece of debris as it's flying nearby you, you vaporize a little chunk of material off the surface of the object that turns into a yes. tiny little propellant stream that gives the debris a kick in the opposite direction. And so now it's as if the piece of debris has fired its own little rocket to slow itself down. In Tiniest the ion drive. Tiniest yeah, ion drive. Right, exactly. The tiniest ion drive. And what's great is that the laser can just sit there and then just fire at different targets as they go by one after the other without having to change its orbit. So I, you just wait. 
I love that there's so many different ideas on how to do this, that when yeah. you said oblate, I went to the, okay, let's destroy millimeter targets. Right. And you went to the, let's create a tiny hole on something to get it to move. Yeah. The ideas are almost as numerous as the space junk, and we just need someone to break down right. and start paying to do it. So there, there have been a couple of papers that, that we've reported on at Universe Today about yeah. these ablative lasers. Most of the ideas are coming out of China. And so like a laser capable of reaching out tens of kilometers perhaps even hundreds of kilometers in space with enough power to vaporize a little piece of titanium is terrifying is kind of terrifying yeah. yeah would you be all right having that in orbit overhead i feel and like it, that it, breaks the outer space treaty somewhere like i mean it's not destroying power. something from a kilometer away that's like a good safe orbital separation yeah. but closer than a kilometer that is uncomfortable yeah and so you can like obviously it doesn't you know any nation who proposes this idea is going to get a lot of pushback from the other nations because you could just turn this thing around and start shooting it at other at functioning satellites mm -hmm. and take them and make them non-operational you could turn it at the ground yeah. and blind things that are pointed in space so yeah. there's there's a lot of downsides but then you could also use it to send off your to Alpha Centauri. So yeah. that's cool for breakthrough star shot. So I think, um, you know, there are challenges that that we're going to have to face to be able to come up with this problem. Of all of them, I think this technology is the is the one that will be most effective, but it's also the one that's the most politically problematic because anyone who launches this thing has I'm a just lot gonna... of dangerous capability yeah. in space. I, I'm just going to keep going with the pin the tail and the donkey idea. Let's let's just do that. You want to do that a hundred thousand times? Sure, it could be fun. I, fun for the aerospace industry to create a, an endless fleet of spacecraft, maybe. But yeah, it is. Like, there was an estimate that I read that we need to remove five defunct satellites a year yeah to keep up with the amount of new satellites that are being launched as well as the amount that are naturally just deorbiting themselves because of atmospheric drag mm -hmm. and that if we don't do that then this problem is just going to get worse and yeah. worse and worse over time yeah it's a scary time yeah yeah and it, it and and i think like we imagine this idea of the castle like one day we're going to wake up and find out that the earth is now enclosed within an impenetrable shield of no. of shrieking debris, but it's just wear and tear. It's just... Have you ever seen or been part of one of the truly massive uh, car pileups that starts with like one car going high speed hits another right. car, people yeah. start slamming on their brakes, which triggers more accidents, which triggers more accidents. And and sometimes if the road isn't that busy, the one accident, it's just those two cars end up off in the medium and everyone slows down to, to lollygag because that's what humans do. The Kessler syndrome is going to be something like that, but much slower, where first you have a defunct satellite hits another satellite. And it creates a little bit of debris that spreads out over time. And some of that debris, maybe months, maybe years later, hits something else. And it's going to add up and hopefully give us time to panic and actually invest money in things that people aren't investing money in. But it would be cheaper to invest now than to have to do it fast-tracked in the future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this like all of these environmental problems that humanity faces, the best thing to do is face the problem head on today, invest what it's going to take to minimize the consequences downstream. Yeah. W will we do it? History says no. Right. And on that happy note, thank you, Pamela. <laughs> thank you, Fraser. And, um, Thank you to all of our patrons who allowed us to create this ends on a very sad note episode. Uh, you make 
everything we do possible. And and I just want to say thank you this week to Planetar, Sean Matz, uh, Andrew Stevenson, GeForce 184, Alex Rain, the mysterious Mark, James Roger, Paul L. Hayden, Karthik Vekatraman, Glenn McDavid, Benjamin Davies, Kami Brassian, Gabriel Galfin, Dean, Stephen Calfee, the Air Major, John Osef, Bart Flaherty, Sam Brooks and his mom, Nate Detweiler, the low Finally, sand person, Brian Kelby, Nula, uh, Lee Zealand, Arctic Fox, John Drake, Corinne Demtruck, Jordan Turner, uh, Lee Hornbarn, or Harborn, rather, Jason uh, Cardukas, Robert uh, Hundle, Kim Barron, Paul Esposito, Bob Zatsky, Ron Thorson, uh, Arthur Latz Hall, DFM, Ruben McCarthy, Daniel Donaldson, Frank Stewart, Time Lord Ira, Will Hamilton, Ian Abdullah, and Jeff McDonald. Thank you. I cannot thank all of you enough. Um, yeah. But we're sure going to try. We thank are. you. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. All right, and now I press save, and I press save, and I save it to the correct folder. All right. There we go. Um, 72. Mm-hmm. Upload it. I've got so much internet. I have a ton of internet, not your size of a ton, but I apparently do not have a US enough USB buses, and I need to figure out how to replug hmm. things into my computer. They make these little bus extenders. They have like or port extenders. They have like you plug in one you'd say USB three and then it's got like a whole bunch of plugs on it. And there's so, powered and unpowered. Yeah. So so the problem that I'm running into is if I run both my camera and my microphone through the the same um set of USB slots, the same card into my computer. Um and I am running at too high a resolution, which I may need to adjust. My camera periodically is like, I shall freeze for a moment. You <laughs> moved. I shall freeze for a moment. Right. <sighs> the eternal which, battle. Which machine are you running? You're, you're running on a one power of the new... I'm on a, uh, i9 Power Mac cheese grater. Oh. Yeah. So you got like one of the former generation before the Apple Silicon. Yeah, I have the one generation before that. Mm. Yeah. Those are expensive and yeah. mediocre. They they it was not mediocre when I bought it. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, it no, no, of course. It was the best I could afford then, when I got it. Yeah, no no, but the you know, these new ones like I'm I'm kind of tempted to go after the uh the Mac mini it was yeah. a Mac Mini Pro. It's like you know, it's got the it's got the M2 architecture, the Pro. Mm -hmm. It's like fifteen hundred bucks or something. It's, it's kind of crazy how fast these things are. Yeah, I'm. I'm but gonna... I, weirdly, I really like using a Windows PC for all of my live streaming. I, I've, I've tried using a Mac, and I just I can't. Better, it turns out. I can't do it. Yeah. Yeah. Just the software is more, even though a Mac is a better audio visual device yeah. when it comes to the specific collection of functionality that I need out of this computer, gaming included, yeah. um, then, uh, then I need a PC. So the, the frustration I run into is like, I, I have a really good gaming PC, and I could use it for streaming, but all of my Adobe licenses are for Mac. And so it's like, I don't Oh, you don't have the monthly. You don't I do, the... but you have, you, you get the monthly and it's, it's only for one platform. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. It's I mean, as... maybe that's new. Cause it used to be that I, I would run my license on my Mac or on my PC. I will have to try that. Last yeah. I looked, it was for only one. Yeah, check and make sure. 
that it's cross. I mean, that's that's the advantage of using Adobe. Okay, is is that it has this cross platform capability. Okay, I will and look at that. And is, if you're going to pay them, whatever it is, twenty five bucks a month. Yeah, I mean, I'm floating between a ton of different iOS devices. Yeah, not iOS, OS X and yeah. iOS. Words are hard. Yeah, um, you are. You're pretty deep into the. Apple um, ecosystem. Yeah, there you go. Shadowcaster Fox is agreeing with me. Okay, I will have to look into that. Mm -hmm. um, okay. You can run on two computers. Yeah. And so you will have two machines that you use. Yeah, but I, like I, I swear by my MacBook, my my Mac Air, my MacBook Air, as my just daily device. Like I spend most of my time on my MacBook Air. Yeah. And I love it. And yet, if I would, I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole for audiovisual stuff. I wouldn't stream from it, et cetera. Yeah. And it seems bonkers to me. So I, it's weird because Mac should be really great at this kind of thing. But but you run through all kinds of hurdles to just connect your audio devices together on the Mac. And it depends on what software I'm using. Um, yeah. Right so. now it's all happy. So this is a 2019 Mac Pro. And it's specifications, it should like slowly take over the world. I just need mm -hmm. to, I, I usually am really good and I plug my camera and my keyboard into the same USB card. And this time I was just like, because I replaced so many things simultaneously, I was a dumbass. And uh, <laughs> Right. Yeah. All right, let's, let's answer some questions here. Um, okay. Hal McKinney asks, if we spin the exterior of a spacecraft without spinning the internal habitat area would the spinning exterior be less permeable to undesirable flying objects okay say that no. one again so if we spin the exterior of a spacecraft without spinning the internal habitat area would that make it safer to space debris no no it it would uh first of all create all sorts of interesting angular momentum issues Second, it would make the astronauts very sad that artificial gravity was that close and they weren't participating in it. <laughs> oh. um, <laughs> but so but but the the thing to think about is if you have the spinning outer edge, um, that actually, if you have something of size that hits it, it's going to cause a tear instead of a hole. Um, mm -hmm. Sort of like, don't do this, but um, like. It, if something stabs your skin and you pull away, that's going to cause a tear versus yeah. just sitting still and not moving when you get. Yeah, I can't think of any way that it wouldn't just either Creatic. just co well just have the same problem. Like mm -hmm. like you would like a piece of space debris is coming in twenty eight thousand kilometers an hour, it and this and the outer station is rotating at I don't know one meter per second. Yeah. Like it's insignificant from the perspective of the piece of space debris it might as well not be moving yeah um rajluta asks can electric propulsion or a combination of solar electric propulsion and solar sails or nuclear reactor uh help catch up with orbital debris it's the same problem yeah. like you yeah if if you could catch that space debris for 100 million dollars instead of 200 million dollars right because you're using an electric a much more efficient electric propulsion system still a ludicrous amount of money per piece of debris so uh it can make the problem less impossible but not really possible these are real problems yeah. Don't think too hard about it if you like yourself. It's kind of <clears> like climate change. There are certain problems. The more you think about, the more you realize their complexity and the solutions for mm. them look more and more expensive. And the realization that no one is going to actually pay for what's needed until it's too late. So Rajalus also asks, is it possible and will it be worth it to recycle the technology rubbish or in the earth? This one gets trickstery, 
because to recycle it would require either boosting it into a higher orbit and collecting it together for on-orbit recycling or figuring out how to land it politely back on the surface of the planet. <laughs> and, and so you start getting into questions about where is the greater expense in creating more of it uh, for creating more expense to be able to build things in orbit out of recycled components or just mining more and lifting it into mm -hmm. space. Now, I'd like to think we eventually reach the point where the more cost-effective option is to basically have that droid factory that you saw in the Star Wars episodes where they grab the defunct things, tear them apart, and recycle the parts that can be reused. I think we're a ways off from doing that, but that's the future I want with less um, intelligent robots being destroyed. I mean, let's do the back of the envelope math, right? Um, what would it cost to build a spacecraft capable of recycling a an object in space i have like, no idea i can't i don't think like if 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 i took a piece of a, if i brought a spacecraft back down to earth yeah and i put it on a table and yeah. i said, okay engineers build a robot that can do something with this the engineers would just look at you blankly and go like how like <laughs> what like, what are you going to do? Is it going to be some kind of multi-armed thing that that carefully solders boards off and so, sets them aside? And like, it, like we wouldn't know yeah. how to recycle a spacecraft apart from just crunching it up into pieces and and putting it in a landfill. Or, so, so or, we need a whole bunch of Jawas that will do the part yeah. that the robots don't know how to do. Yeah. And I mean, part of what I see in my head is the you melt everything down and use chemical engineering to figure out how to get the different metals back apart. Yeah. And we do a yeah. bit of that, right? Like we do recycle electronic parts yeah. today, but most of the time people think it's not worth it. Yeah. And that's it on Earth. Imagine trying to multiply that having it in space but like the future think but of the future 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 i want the future to be able to do this yeah and so the problem just goes back to every single one of those i mean you know i mean the 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 advantage is that they already have orbital velocity that's what they have going for them the disadvantage is everything else so so i i can't think of any people people ask me this question all the time like what well, seems like such a waste to have all of that debris in space when we need to launch stuff into space and you're right it's just we have we don't know how to do this yeah yeah and so and what we do know is how to spend 150 million or 200 million dollar spacecraft to recover a satellite at least tap a satellite we don't even know how to recover them like bring one down safely to earth like we could make a spacecraft that could go out with a little robotic arm on it and go tap 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 to a to a dead spacecraft that's that's as far as we could do, go and obviously with anti-satellite weapons we know how to destroy them but to actually no we know how to fragment any, them yeah yeah so but to actually do anything productive is beyond us but the future. I but want the this future. future. Well, of course, we all do. Yeah. Um, Sears Kaylee asks, what's a good microphone to control your Windows desktop by voice? I've never tried. Yeah, I live mostly in the Apple ecosystem. I've, I've been finding that the Razer stuff works super well with windows yep. um so like i i got a lower end razor headset that has all the parts are replaceable so when the dogs break the cable i only have to replace the cable um and and it it works super well um i don't know how it works with cortana though because i'm not using cortana it's so 100 percent. i agree with you on the razor recommendation yeah. um 
so my go-to, like if I if I have someone on the team that doesn't have a good microphone, mm -hmm. I'll send them a Razer mic. I'll just go to Amazon yeah. and order them a Razer mic. The the their version of the, like the USB condenser mic, like what in front of me, it's like thirty five bucks. Yeah. So and it's good. So really, any microphone that you can stick in front of your face, the closer you can get a microphone to your face, the better. Yeah, and I like headsets because then I can move and the mic comes mm. with me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't I don't own a headset. I mean I own headsets, but I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't use anything for my computer. But but for like ordering your computer around. Mm hmm Like I I David Joseph Wesley, he's worked with our show before. He's visually impaired and visiting him is like stepping into the Star Trek future. Cause yeah. he has figured out how to use all of these digital assistants. Yeah. And and so I am not at his level, but he has inspired me to figure out how to just make my environment what I want using Siri. Yeah, it's a really interesting. And Carl and I were noting, like, if you notice that Siri and Apple Assistant and or sorry, Google Assistant and Alexa, they haven't gotten any better. Like they've mm. just stalled out at at. But the yeah, sent me a timer for five minutes. The tools right? you can plug into them have gotten more numerous. So, I uh, sure one one of one of my friends who some of you may know from Discord is Ms. Uh, Neon Kitten or Ms. Brick Kitten, depending on where you're online. Um, she uses Google Assistant for her entire house, and so she can do things like living room set to daylight. And I do all, the same. I have the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm mostly arguing with Google about that it's really me, that it says I don't understand. Like it's had oh, 10 years. I don't have and any I, of those issues. I'll say like, you know, turn on the living room lights and it'll be like, I don't understand. Your oh. voice doesn't match your voice match settings. Please go and update it. And oh, I, I don't have it. that problem. I like, still don't understand you. And and then you ask it slightly complicated questions and it oh. just goes like, I don't know what? You know, how many, uh, I'm trying to think of like, the, you know, you may ask it like, what was the result of the vote for the Senate today? And it just goes like, oh, pardon, right? <laughs> and like, you've had 10 years, but I do feel like we are now on the cusp of this revolution with these new large language models like chat yeah. GPT, the downside and like this is this is really interesting to me, and this is you know this may be a rant, but but <laughs> they are they are they hallucinate, they bullshit, yeah, but they are crazily effective at at doing things that are also very useful, yeah. And so the question is, like, are you willing? to work with a tool mm -hmm. that you can't trust but makes you more productive over the long run and my answer is yes right like if like yeah if i'm going to ask it to for a bunch of facts and information to add up a bunch of numbers and i know that it's going to be wrong but it's you know it's the equivalent of me asking my kid like Hey, you know, Logan, I add up all those, add up the calories and all those different raw ingredients and give me the total. And he comes with the total and it's off by 20. It's fine. It's close enough. Yeah. So I guess I'm at the point where, like, I will ask Siri things like, who, uh, who are the actors in a given movie when I'm trying to figure out something like that? Who right. played character X in movie Y? Um is Petco still open? Um, things like that, that that I need an assistant to just Google things mm -hmm. for me. And at the needing an assistant to Google things for you, it's really good. Mm -hmm. And Siri, I've learned, has gotten better and better the more I use her. So like, mm. if, if I say, uh, play the news knows instantly to play the news from NPR because NPR is the station I go to and I never had to say that. And 
this this ability that they have to learn and I'll see Siri suggestions on my phone on the regular because she'll notice that like I open certain apps almost the same time every day and so I'll unlock my phone and Siri will be like do you wish to go here well yes yes I do Siri right um the only problem I run into is I've gotten so used to that I walk into my office, my studio, or my bedroom, and I can just order the lights about. And I walked into the pantry the other day with my arms full, and our pantry does not have a Siri device to turn the lights on. It has a switch on the wall, and I felt like a moron for a moment. Right, yeah. And, and so I think the problem that Google and Bing and all these stuff yeah. have, that because these things lie, hallucinate, bullshit, and are unreliable, they will be held liable for the results that come out of it. And so if a, person, if a person says, you know, make me, a, provide me a recipe for a peach cobbler, mm -hmm. and they end up concocting uh, some kind of poisonous gas, um, mm -hmm. then Google will be liable because Google suggested the recipe. And so they can't unleash the power of this, of these large language models because the risks are so great. And they keep and, becoming racist. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? It's, and so, it's really problematic. And so this is the AI alignment problem mm -hmm. in a nutshell. But imagine if it also had the ability to dismantle your atoms at an atomic level and use them for paper clips, right? We, like, we are, like, that we are, is the future that we are striding forward into. We're, we're at an inflection point where the choices we make now decide if we get the Star Trek computers, if yeah. we get the Matrix, or if we get Cylons. I feel like one of these three things will happen, and possibly all three consecutively. Or um, we just get our atoms used for something that computers would prefer. Yeah, yes. paper clips. Yeah. I think yeah, that's I the Matrix future. I think we get... I don't think so. Because the Matrix, you could still... like up and and fight the computers but i think we True. get we get we either solve the problem and we have our our plastic pal that's fun to be with <laughs> right or we're turned into paper clips and on that happy note like that that like you think space junk is a problem uh yeah. you know us running headlong into artificial intelligence developing the uh, seeds of our own doom is even worse. But on that happy note, thank you everyone <laughs> for joining us here on Astronomy Cast today. Thank you to uh, all of the people watching us, both on YouTube and on Twitch. Thanks to all of our moderators and all the people who ask us questions. So much fun. Thanks in advance to the producers and audio editors who will have to face this tangled mass of uh, brain leaving. Uh, we thank you for your service. Thanks to all the patrons who yes. support this work and support the team behind the scenes. And Pamela, thank you for thank bringing you. the brain each and every week. We will see all of you next week. Bye-bye, everyone.